you seeing me right now? The answer is yes or no, and if you can't choose, you can't perceive me. You don't know whether I'm here or not. Lunar zero, yes or no. Binary logic is something you depend on. Without it, you can't have so much as a single perception. One and zero. To be or not to be. Electric matter is but a mirror which reflects qualities outside itself to simulate those qualities within itself. Thinking is a dual electric dynamic process by means of which images of the imagination are given seeming form, motion and condition. Binary dual logic is something we depend on, and if we can base our insights to how the universe works on binary logic, we might have found a way to accomplish the aim of physical science to explain all physical phenomena by means of a simple formula or principle. Walter Russell states in his work that this simple principle underlying all effects can only be found in the mathematical and material basis of the wave and in the repetitive principle of that basis. The wave machine in nature's workshop acquires its seemingly different properties because of the gyroscopic wheels, which spin them into their various conditions and spiral action combines the principle of the circle with the principle of crowd expressed by the golden section. In Russell's work, growth is expressed by means of octave ratios, which comes down to a doubling or a halving. There are different ways of writing these ratios. The most important one is based on Russell's formula of the log potentials. The log potentials represent discrete stadia of 100% full growth in a cycle.
But what is more interesting is the process between those locked positions, which we call grout. This process of grout is described by an exponential function and the number e, which describes continuous exponential grout. For example, in man's life cycle, the change happens in a series of discrete steps. There are four stages from infancy to adulthood and four stages from adulthood to old age. But a baby doesn't become an infant all of a sudden. It grows to become an infant. We say that a quantity grows exponentially if it multiplies at a constant rate, in the sense that over any interval of the same length it multiplies by the same amount. But also a quantity which rotates at a constant speed is growing exponentially. In any interval of the same length it rotates by the same amount. Nature's method of growth is like a motion picture projection machine and its method of projecting series of pictures is so fast that the illusion of motion is created. Nature's thought wave picture changes over 700 billion times a second, which is its speed of thought, according to Leo Russ. Grout is an essential part of a living process. Leonardo da Vinci, amongst others, demonstrated that all living processes are characterized by a very specific internal geometry, whose most direct visible manifestation is the morphological proportion of the golden section. Fibonacci demonstrated that the growth of populations of living organisms always follows a series derived from the golden section. Since Rossellian spirals claim to represent living processes, they must be coherent with the golden section. So are they. Did you notice the space between the little cubes in the previous drawing, which from both sides will ultimately approach zero? Something I noticed when making this drawing is that even though I kept having the little squares and volume towards the center, the zero can never be reached.
Same goes for the other side. You can go on forever and ever doubling, no boundary will be reached. Could this be proof for some of Russell's statements? To be or not to be. Life and death are related. They are reciprocals. In practical terms, this means that life and death are equal but opposite. If life is halved, then death is also halved, but in the opposite direction, like the principle of a seesaw. Life and death meet equally at their centering equator, which is midway to one life cycle. On either side of that equator, life or death is preponderant, but both are still present because we are dying when we are born and living when we are dying. It's to say for now that life breeds death and death breeds life, which in more extreme terms means that, just like a phoenix rising out of the ashes, something can come out of nothing. A principle that was eloquently mathematically translated by Leibniz, although disregarded by some less fortunate minds. Leibniz believed logic, or the laws of thought, could be moved from a verbal state into an absolute mathematical condition, which he described as a sort of universal language or script, very easy to understand without any dictionaries. Leibniz's binary system, as product of the mind, describes a living process, so it might not come as a surprise that it is easily applicable to Russellian concepts. According to Russell, all direction is curved. The circle possesses by its very nature an intrinsic absolute measure, namely one complete cycle of rotation. Each arc has an absolute value as an angle, and the regular subdivisions of the circle define certain specific angles and arcs in a lawful fashion. In mathematics, a unit circle is a circle with a radius of 1, centered at the origin. What is interesting about this is that nature works in cycles, and in a way, circular action must reflect uniquely part of the creative process of the universe, like the cycle of the Earth which makes one rotation around the Sun in one year. And this periodic cycle can be constructed by a series of divisions of the circle. 
For example, if we want to indicate the period of one full actual rotation of the Earth indicated in hours, we divide the circle in 24. So we divide the full rotation of 360 degrees into 24 equal angles. Then each such displacement of 15 degrees corresponds to one hour in frequency, as is done by Russell in the image. The process of creation of the universe is determined by conical spiral motion, which determines an absolute value for every existence in the universe. Since the universe is musical, according to ancients, what better way to apply the principles of curvature and golden ratio synthesized in the conical spiral action to music? Let's go back to Russell's drawing of a spiral. On this drawing, you will notice some magenta and some green squares overlaid. The green squares are not depicted by Russell in his drawing. They are a result of intermediary points on the spiral. As previously demonstrated, the squares and cubes have certain octave ratios with regard to each other. Mathematically, it can be found that there is a connection between the potential position and the side of a square, which in turn is proportional to the string length, a relationship determined by an exponential function. So how does this relate to music or to a harp string? In practical terms, what we are going to do is revolve the exponential function around an axis. For this we need to go back to the circle. Not only the octaves, but all musical intervals correspond to specific angles on conical spirals. This is more clearly seen if we project our conical spiral onto a plane perpendicular to the axis. If we divide the full 360 degrees rotation into 24 equal angles, then each such angle of 15 degrees displacement will correspond to a semitone interval in frequency. This means that half a circle, or an arc of 180 degrees, will correspond to one octave, and two octaves making a full circle. The radial lengths defined by the spiral at the indicated 12 angles of one octave are exactly proportional to the string division, or inversely proportional to the frequencies of the equal tempered musical scale. In the example, we have scaled the entire octave, which is half a circle circumference, equal to 1, which means that the unit of radius that needs to be taken into account equals 1 divided by pi.
According to Russell, the eye is a mighty deceiver. So what we perceive as a spiral might be an illusion caused by the visual system. The information gathered by the eye is processed in the brain to give a percept that does not accord totally with the physical measurement of the stimulus source. To appreciate how this works, imagine a dot traveling clockwise in a circle. Consider how the center of the circle just described is traveling along an axis with a certain length from the front to the back. The circling dot will trace out a helix with a displacement following the axis leading the vertical displacement. Nevertheless, the entire process of motion will give you the illusion of a three-dimensional object, even though there was only a plane and dot to start with. Even more, the illusion of depth will be created by the eye, which will turn cylinders into cones and circles into spiral constructions with different radii. This should lead us to the important conclusion that the different radii we have constructed in our spiral might not really be there, but in order for our physical reality to work, they must be present somehow. According to Walter Russell, there is from nature's point of view but one element, which is carbon, and all the other elements are different pressure conditions of that one. In more practical terms, this means that truth is simply a matter of perspective and that all things are created by our senses, which create distortions and all other illusions of the mind. In a way, we are to some degree already aware of the illusion, like a train track which of in the distance merges to the senses, yet knowing knows that the tracks never merge. In time our knowing will exceed our sensing, and we will no longer be deceived by the illusions of our senses. All this is a long introduction to conclude that the spiral motion in three dimensions might be conical in shape or not, and its means of construction depends on what we believe to be there. When a conical shape is used with dimensions following the same logic as that of the radii, we will get the resilient spiral. But the spiral could also be based on a cylinder, 
which will create the same illusion of diminishing radial dimensions in depth. Our senses will turn this cylinder into a point at infinity, similar like the point railroad tracks create at the end of the horizon. Let's consider this single point. If we could agree that a point is nothing other than a ring turned into a point by your senses and perspective distortions, then this point will eventually vanish into nothing. And being unextended, it conforms with Russell's definition of mind. It is easy to accept that mind contains the whole idea of creation, including the idea of all the numbers between zero and infinity, in all directions, signs and orientation. These numbers exist as simulated divisions of mind in motion in an extremely precise way, guaranteed to produce a net result of nothing, so that it's ultimately defined by the number zero, the inverse of which is infinity. Unlike the number 1, which can be divided, the number 0 is indivisible, therefore it is a true, immaterial, unextended, immortal, with no resultant parts. The previous cylinder, merging to a point and vanishing into a structured nothing that is rotating forever and ever into infinity is in mathematics known as Euler's formula. This formula turns exponential growth into a circle and perfect cosine and sine waves are created that go on forever. Moreover, it generates a unit circle with perfect balance between negative and positive numbers, between real and imaginary numbers, and between zero and infinity. No element is privileged over any other. The net effect of the formula is zero. The circle negative half perfectly cancels its positive half. Yet, this is an infinite zero, a structured nothing.
Life is a helical structure made of waves, which are spirals, and spirals are curved. The curvature is caused by resistance, and wave pistons play an essential role in this curvature of gravity. Waves are the levers of the universal pump, and its pistons are gravity, which polarizes and depolarizes in time frequencies. So wave pistons are gravity, and they are made out of spirals themselves. Insight in their construction will in time reveal the mystery of creation. Leibniz famously asked why there is something rather than nothing. The answer is something is nothing, as we can see in Euler's formula. A simple zero is nothing and yet an infinite information system based on superposition of infinite waves of every conceivable permutation, all of which produce the sum of zero, or mind, which is source of eternal energy. Energy is eternal, which can be seen because Euler's circle never stops spinning. Nothing can ever halt it, because ultimately there is nothing there. Euler's circle is simply an ordered and structured nothingness that can never perish. It's always rotating and can never stop. All of the energy balances to zero and has no effect. And the energy exists dimensionlessly, hence it's no part of the material world. According to Walter Russell, the only attractive power in all the universe lies in the dimensionless static universe of the undivided zero, which centers the dynamic spectrum. This explains the mystery of how space swallows up the dynamic matter which emerged from it. Life is perfect, mind does not make mistakes. There are fundamental, immutable laws that govern nature. The hand of mind lies in the precise nature of physical laws, in their mathematical beauty and elegance, and in their simplicity. The very fact that there are natural laws that the human mind can discover is evidence of a mind. Not a mind who superseded these laws, but one who created them whatever form they might take. 
everything that is possible demands to exist. There is no other way. the numbers and the equations and logics that lead to reason. But after a lifetime of such pursuits, I ask, what truly is logic? Who decides reason? My quest has taken me through the physical, the metaphysical, the delusional, and back. discovery of my life. It is only in the mysterious equations of love that any logical reasons can be found.